Hello and welcome to Trash Compactor. I'm Josh, and today we have two very special guests to discuss how the young Indiana Jones TV series, which ran on ABC in the early 1990s, paved the way for Star Wars Episode One and the rest of the prequel trilogy to be made. And I'm very pleased to welcome the hosts of the Young Indie Chroniclers, Peter Holmstrom and Daniel Noah, to Trash Compactor. Welcome, guys. Great to be here. Hello. So, Young Indiana Jones. Firstly, I just... I'm curious how your podcast came to be. What inspired you to do a podcast devoted to Young Indy? Well, I actually met Peter for the first time at Star Wars Celebration, so that's perfectly appropriate for this podcast, back in 2022 in Anaheim. And I was an admirer of his work as a podcaster. And I think just as part of a casual conversation, it came up that, you know, I said, there's actually no podcast about Young Indiana Jones. It's like the one sort of franchise thing that there's just nothing you know there's so many i mean we're, this is a star wars podcast there are many there are several indiana even indiana jones podcasts there's quite there's a handful of those right and that's a smaller amount and i thought this was just an interesting niche and that there was room there for someone to do something interesting and then i give credit for peter to inviting me to do it with him he you know he was like i I think this is an interesting idea. Would you do it with me? And I was like, yeah, I'll do it with you. And I'd never done a podcast before. I, I, I tell people I did three episodes of the Temple of Geek podcast last spring about Star Trek Picard. That's it. That's my experience. Peter is the, the podcast master. I don't know about master. I do remember, though, we were actually out to dinner before a screening of Revenge of the Sith. Like there was a repertory screening of it here in L.A., and uh, we just met up and went out to dinner and we were just chatting about Star Wars, chatting about Lucas and this being kind of a whole, not just in terms of fan appreciation, but also in terms of critical and academic analysis. There just isn't a lot out there about the television series and the franchise. And there's a lot of it. Like there's 22 feature length episodes that anyone can watch at any time. And we both were like, this show is underappreciated. The show has so much going for it in ways that have been largely forgotten. So we were like, hey, you know what? Shining a bit of a light on it. It feels like the sort of show that if it was certainly happening today, we get a lot of attention. You know, it, frankly, if it happened in the era of the internet, right, which it sort of missed by a handful of years, you know, there would just be more stuff about it. People would, there'd be more things preserved, articles, you know, people like us would have had podcasts about it, right, then. And it missed all that. So I think it just felt like, there's a lot here. There's actors, directors, artists, people who worked on the show who are significant historically and as, far, as part of the industry. Certainly George Lucas himself as the creator of the show. You know, if you if you look at time spent, you know, hours on screen in his live action work, it's a huge percentage and largely unexamined. You know, how many people examine all the Star Wars movies in detail? The Clone Wars has had watch through podcasts, right? So it just felt like, all the pieces are there, and, and there's really no downside to talking about it. And then the last piece, I think, that really pushed it was last summer, in preparation for the release of Dial of Destiny, all the episodes went on Disney+, Plus, and actually all the episodes are streaming for the first time. That's never been the case on streaming. They've been available on DVD, but the episode with Harrison Ford, uh, up until the Disney Plus release, had, had never been available. So there was that moment of, okay, now we're talking about something people can watch you know, pretty easily, right? That That's a low lift. And so it changes it from being perhaps a little more archaic to a little more accessible of a conversation. No, absolutely. When it showed up on Disney Plus, I was like, oh, that's right. I never actually sat down and watched this show. And then I came across your podcast. I was saying off air, it's a really well done, fantastic, very informative show where I'm hearing a lot of stories that I had certainly never heard. I heartily recommend that if anyone enjoys listening to this podcast that they do check out the Young Indie Chroniclers. Peter, I think you use the word whole, and I think for some Star Wars fans, you know, the period from 1983 to 1999 is sort of a big empty hole, but, you know, George Lucas was sort of furiously building his companies and pioneering new production techniques and technologies to move the art of filmmaking forward. What role did Young Indy play in that regard? Well, I think Young Indy, in some ways, the thesis for our whole podcast is like young Indy is kind of his masterpiece like it is the moment where all of his creative energies kind of 
congeal together into this wondrous thing. You know, I mean, he's talked on the record a few times that I like. He, he kind of felt like he was kept getting dragged back into Star Wars. But Young Indy is, is purely just his own, like, I want to see this happen. It fulfills his own love of education, of history, of action adventure, and, you know, very much is kind of an anthology kind of show as well. In terms of the technological stuff, it's like what he was doing with the series is kind of similar to what Alfred Hitchcock did with Psycho, is that he was trying to devise ways to tell a cinematic level story in a television format on a television budget. It's a fairly good sized budgeted show for the era, but it, it's not out of the norm. I believe we determined the budget was about 1.5 million per episode, which was basically like what, you know, your good prestige show would have cost back then. But he's working on ways to bring in even grander scope than what you would have seen in other dramas at the time. So when you do watch the show, it looks like a movie and it's hindered a bit because it's a one, three, three aspect ratio and you know, it's DVD quality. So it still has kind of that VHS hue to it, but there's just some, some wondrous scopes to the whole thing. And then in terms of lining it up with the star Wars prequels, it's like, He's hiring a lot of young talent at the time, a lot of, you know, fresh faced people who are also just incredibly talented. So you're seeing Rick McCallum come on board as producer who then becomes the prequel trilogy producer and just kind of producer, you know, on call for every Lucasfilm project for until he retired from Lucasfilm. You also have Trisha Bigger as as the costume designer. You have Gavin Bacoy, who's there. I think it's Baquette. Baquette. But- Baquette. There we go. Um, who's uh, there as the production designer. And David Tattersall as the cinematographer, all of whom would then go on to work in the Star Wars prequels. So, you know, you're seeing this technology. This was his first television show to be shot digitally. You know, he's utilizing the um, edit droid, which would later become Avid, which is today the industry standard. Well, this was the first television show to, to ever utilize that technology. It's just wondrous in that way. It's a true fusion point of both old world Hollywood sensibilities and then kind of the new burgeoning technological changes that Lucas would be pioneering with the show and then subsequently with the prequels. And just to correct for the film nerds, it was it was post-produced digitally. Uh, excuse the series me. was yes. shot excuse on, on yes. film, on, on 16 millimeter film, which, um, and David Tattersall talks about that in a featurette I found on the Attack of the Clones DVD where he talks about shooting Young Indy on 16 millimeter, which was considered sort of an inferior film stock at the time. They did it for cost and lightness of footprint, you know, that they could take a small crew, two to three operators into a, a jungle or, you know, a remote location and, and fully be able to use the camera, which you couldn't do with a 35 millimeter camera. And I think he was comparing that to what they did go on to do with digital cameras in, in 2000 and how this was sort of the next step of that. But it's, it is a technological achievement. And on the question of budget, there was a book we found uh, called George Lucas, The Creative Impulse, which a lot of people know, but apparently we didn't know this until very recently. It was republished in 1997. And when it was republished, the young indie section was completely revised. So you have two completely different sort of chapters on young indie in the two versions of this book. And in the new version... It addresses the re-edits to, to a degree uh, and the framing of the series as 22 movies. And it uses a budgetary figure of $4 million per film, which accounts for the $1.5 million uh, that, that he spoke of times two. And then a little extra to sort of extra post, new post-production and, and all the things that were, were done to them, right? And it makes the point in the book that at 22 films, you're only talking of around $100 million dollars for the entire set, which was the price of a big, very big, you know, a, a, a large scale film, right, at that time. And they were saying, we can make 22 films for the price of one, right? And they were quite proud of that. And I think it challenges the idea of like, what does a film need to be? What does it need to have to entertain, right? To amuse, to inform, to educate. And they were really trying to do that at, at a price. You know, it occurs to me, maybe I, I should give a, a quick brief rundown of the show itself, just for any, if any of your listeners out there are like, what the hell are these people talking about? So just very quickly, Young Indiana Jones was a television series that aired in 1992 through 1990, technically, I guess, 1993 on ABC, an hour-long program focused on Young Indiana Jones, both as a kind of toddler, you know, 
eight to 10 year old indie. And then also as a teenage indie, eight to 10, he'd be traveling over Europe and, and the world, well, the, the whole world, uh, with his father and mother kind of experiencing the grandeur and, and seeing the world open up for him in, in new ways. And then the teenage indie would be involved with him entering into World War One and kind of having that loss of innocence as, as he finds the world uh, is not as rosy and wonderful as he found it when he was a child and kind of gradually becoming the jaded hero that we meet in the movies. But the show didn't quite click. It got canceled. But then it was later revived on the Family Channel as a TV movie of the week. So there was four television movies produced for the Family Channel. And then Lucas didn't quite want to let the series go, so he tried to repackage the series into VHS movie releases. So he'd edit together single episodes into movie-length content and even record some new two new episodes in addition to that just for the VHS market. And when we talked about Harrison Ford earlier, Harrison Ford did come in to do a cameo for one of the episodes that aired on ABC to do these kind of a bookend, you know, introducing the episode. Well, and, and, it, and it production-wise, and we're, we're, just, we're talking about Star Wars, uh, it, it kind of butts into the prequels a little bit. He, he mentioned Gavin Paquette, who's the production designer on the series and on the prequels. There's actually a point, if you look at the credits in production order, he kind of leaves to go work on the prequels, right? Like several key people sort of end up going to work on the prequels and there are replaced. So Ricky, I think, I don't know if it's pronounced Ayers or Eris, but he kind of comes in as production designer in some of the later ones um, as you see that handoff, right? Uh, and I think that's just fascinating that, you know, there's so much going on and, and Gavin has to go work on something else now. And there was even filming as part of the re-edit into the 22 films. And we're, work, we're still working on identifying kind of all the editing changes. But some of them involve new sequences that were shot and put into these episodes, often bringing back key actors, like guest actors from the episodes, right, who they, they film new material with. And the last piece of this, according to, I think, a book called The Cinema of George Lucas, is a scene in what is now called My First Adventure, where the narrative has been altered so that Lawrence of Arabia catches up to Demetrius in the middle of the film, and, and he captures him, but the artifact is still lost, which sets up the cliffhanger for later. And according to that book, that scene was shot during the production of The Phantom Menace in Tunisia. And it's the last piece of a shot in 1997, which is when Phantom Menace was shot in Tunisia. Uh, so it's, it's all sort of one big soup, right? And it's, it's a wonderful mystery box for us. And to your point earlier, you talked about how like, a lot of fans don't quite even register that George Lucas was busy between 83 and 99. It's, it's wondrous as you really get into it. It's like, no, he was so busy. Like, just incredibly busy guy on so many different projects. I know, I mean, even I used to talk, you know, I used to say how, like, George was incapable of doing more than one project at a time. I mean, that's why, you know, we didn't get Indy 4 for so many years. And, you know, digging into it now, I'm just like, my God, this guy was just insanely busy. Just not only with Young Indy, but then you also look at, like, Willow, you know, Tucker, Man of Dreams, Radio Land Murders, you know, even Return to Oz he was involved with, and, you know, Howard the Duck, if any Howard the Duck fans are out there. Um, <laughs> but it's like he, he wasn't just like signing checks and then, you know, going to his yacht or whatever, like some, you know, executives would today. He, he was actively involved with every one of these productions in a, in a creative and also a advisory kind of role. It was, it was really remarkable. I feel like Lucas gets a lot, you know, he, he perhaps gets criticism as being only focused on the technology. And often when, when the young Indiana Jones Chronicles is referenced, if it's referenced at all, it's, it's sort of like saying George used the show to build digital technology that he'd go on to use Star Wars and almost treats the show as if it was like a, a digital afterthought. It, it was just about the technology for him. And I'll tell you, every interview we've had, we've spoken with three writers, spoken to a director, uh, we've spoken to people who worked on, in post-production. George was so invested in this show on a story and a narrative and a thematic level, and, you know, Everyone we've talked to said that he was passionate about the history, about the theme. You know, one of the directors we spoke to said that, you know, the theme of every episode was so important. And I just, the more we learn, the more it just shows the, the heart of an artist, you know, and the eye of an artist and the mind of an artist at work. There was an interview I read today. I don't know when this will come out, but the Empire Magazine Star Wars issue is out now. And there was an interview with Hayden Christensen that I read today where he shared this moment of filming the scene where his mother dies in the movie and how Lucas came to him in his dressing room and worked through the scene with him. 
And doesn't that just run contrary to all the stories we've heard? Oh, he just says faster, more intense. He doesn't direct. He just points the key. Like, like no, he's a director. And, you know, if it was just one story, but, but everyone we've talked to has shown how involved he was, what a clear vision he had for what he was trying to accomplish, you know, for tone. I mentioned Camille Paglia to Peter recently. She has a great piece on Revenge of the Sith that she does and, and how good the ending is. But one of the things she said was it shows a complete mastery of tone. And I think that's something that Lucas in, in the series has so many different tones, right? It shifts tone. Each episode has its own sort of angle, but he's able to do that. He's able to do madcap comedy, action movie, drama, romantic drama, you know, kids hijinks getting in trouble movie, right? All those things are in the young Indiana Jones Chronicles. And it just, it's a, it's an artist's masterwork. And I think it needs to be treated that way. It, it's an anthology show in a lot of ways, but it, in many ways, it's the most anthology show I've ever seen in my life. Like, uh, you know, Tales from the Crypt or The Twilight Zone or whatever. It, like, might be it is a new cast, new story every week, but it's all essentially the same. You know, it's like you got a vibe, you got a, a sensibility, and you're, you're fitting a show into a, a framework. Young Indie, though, it's like there's a different framework every week. Sometimes you want to do a comedy. Sometimes you want to do a, an action flick. Sometimes you want to do war as hell. Sometimes you want to do a uh, romance during war can be really cool. You know, it's like there's all of these different tones. It's remarkable. I mean, we're hoping to talk to some of the, the key actors here soon just to try to ask, like, how the hell did you wrap your head around this? You know, as an actor, it, it must have been just some of the biggest challenges. Yeah, I mean, I recall... It must have been 1993. I was a kid and I, I caught an episode of American Masters on PBS about George Lucas. And there's behind the scenes footage. Now I can place it. They were shooting the Harrison Ford sequences for that one episode that you were referring to. And it's in the snow. I think they shot it on his property in Wyoming, correct? And yeah, uh, Harrison right. Ford's own ranch. Um, he agreed to the episode, but he didn't want didn't to leave home for, right. for it. So they went to him. And this was toward the end of the hour in American Masters. And it's it's really this snapshot in time because they were demonstrating the capability of the digital technology at the moment. And they were using the example of crowd duplication from a scene in Young Indy. I remember seeing that as a kid and sort of being like, wow, it's amazing that they can do that. It's a, but how do you think experimenting with techniques like that allowed young indie to have the scope and the and the breadth and the the ambition that it had for you know is as you say they made 22 feature films for the price of one i think with luke with george he thinks in shots right so if you're going to tell a story about indiana jones in paris and you know 1916 you never want to be as a director right you never want to be in a position where you can't turn the camera a certain way and I think that's what he uses the technology for on a very basic level, you know, in Indy and Star Wars and anything. He wants to be able to turn the camera a certain way and have whatever the camera sees be right. So when you're talking about crowd replication or map paintings, right, you know, converting a, a modern city perhaps into something from 100 years ago, that's how he uses the technology. I think it's easier, of course, to do that in, in the real world. And, and when creating environments that are based in reality, where perhaps there's photographic reference or costume referencing and so forth. But I, in terms of it being a test bed for Star Wars, I think that's what you see, which is, can I create this immaculate reality of the early 20th century in 1992? And if I can do that, maybe I can create the alien planet that's in my head and equally make that convincing, right? But it's all about being able to put the camera there. Yeah, I think George never thinks in small ways. Like, even when he is thinking, like, okay, I have X amount of dollars, he's wanting to stretch those dollars as far as he can. Whether it's THX 1138 or you look at American Graffiti, they took the time to make it a flushed out world, even when it would have cost a lot of money you know, wrangling extras, you know, there, there's undoubtedly there were people there being like, why do you need this? Like, why do you need a, a diner full of people? Uh, why do you need a street full of cars? You know, like, why can't we just do this with a couple of cars, you know, and we'll just fake it. But it's like, no, he wants the world to feel lived in. He wants the world to feel populated. I think the prequels are such a great example of this, where you look at, you, you know, you freeze frame any crowd shot. It's not just like a bunch of humans running around or a bunch of like uniformed you know individuals it's like 
the diversity of alien life uh, speaks to a, a very lived in galaxy. And I think when you look at Young Indy, what he's what the the mission there was, we need to recreate the early part of the 20th century and do it in an authentic way. You know, he grew up watching movies and television shows where it wasn't authentic, where it was clear that like it is just a soundstage. You had 20 extras, you know, or whatever you had. You never lose the sense that you're watching a television show. And I think he w- he really wanted for the viewer to be like, no, I'm actually, I'm there. This, to have a similar experience that we, a lot of us do have in the movie theater, where you can lose yourself in the, the film. I think he wanted to achieve that on television. And the only way to really do that was to push the technology, to, to be able to recreate certain things, either through digital techniques or through other, other techniques, but to make you believe that it is 1917 uh, or 1910 or whatever. And um, I think he's really successful at that. I think he deserves full credit. Not until the movie 1917 did I think anyone came close to his depiction of World War I in the, in the reality of it and, and the, the visceralness of it. So good for him. Yeah. We were speaking off air about one of the potential barriers to someone coming at the show fresh and enjoying it is sort of the, um, you know, you really have to place yourself in the context of the TV landscape in the 1990s, you know, and it isn't helped by the fact that it's only available in, in DVD quality. And from what I understand from what some people on your podcast have said, like there are certain reasons why it will probably remain that way. But what's so interesting to me is if you can set all that stuff aside, it's amazing the degree to which Young Indy fits right in the TV landscape of now in the sense that it really is cinematic in its look and its scope. I think in your interview with Dan Madsen, he made the point that, you know, nobody really knew what to make of this show because it it was sort of an anthology and it was sort of a different tone every week. And it like had a look that kind of made it look like a film. You know, meanwhile, you have that right up against like Melrose Place. And it's like, what is this? In so many ways, it was ahead of its time. And I think treating the medium of television not as like a lesser cousin of film was one of its innovations that I don't think it gets a lot of credit for. I'm not really sure I had a question in there. (laughs) No, I mean, I I think you hit it right on the head there, which is like at that time in television, TV was thought of as lesser than movies. And, you know, there was plenty of actors out there. I mean, this was the old cliche, but like there was the feeling of just like, if you go to television as an actor or as a creative, even your career is over. Or your career is less than than it would have been had you been in television. There's plenty of instances of TV shows. You could look at Cheers. You could look at, I don't know, uh, you know, let's stick to Cheers, I guess. Mash. Since I, Mash. Cheers, Mash. You know, shows Mash. where your stars will leave because they're like, this is holding me back. I need to go pursue movies because movies are where it's at. And movies are where, you know, I could find creative fulfillment and more money, obviously, whatever. And, you know, I'll get respect, whereas TV was not that. And I think now it's different. You know, I mean, just what was it? Two days ago, Shogun, the remake of Shogun or the new version of Shogun premiered on FX. And back then, though, Shogun was considered a miniseries. And miniseries were kind of where prestige television could exist in where shows could have a bit of a bigger budget, a bit of a bigger scope, but it was always a very contained story, and you kind of knew that. You know, I was just today re-watching the Dune miniseries that came out in 2000. It's three episode, three hour and a half episodes, and then that's it. It's a contained story, and you know that, you know, and they treat it like that. Indie, though, is a little different in that, like, it's an ongoing series, but you're not, you know, television in 1992 was, like, reusing your normal sets you have your regular set of characters you have basically a format for what the episode's going to be and there's a comfort in that and i think people at the time were looking for comfort in their television even from dramas even from dark dramas but like kind of the familiar you know and indie was never familiar every episode was different so today it would absolutely i think work a lot better i think there's something that people don't think about now because the show you know maybe didn't work at that mass level But George Lucas revolutionized cinema in 1977, right? I think there's there's an alternate reality where he revolutionized television in 1992, right? We just don't live in that reality. But his attitude towards television in that era was sort of as, I want nothing to do with the current status quo, as it was when when he did that in film, right? He did see something 
possible in TV that I think was so, it's almost insulting to the medium. Like he almost insulted all of television by saying, you're not good enough. You know, I have something grander in mind. And television looked back at him and said, no. <laughs> you know, like, like, because television and cinema work differently. You know, it, it, today we talk about direct-to-consumer streaming, right? You could argue that this, the theater, the cinema, is more of a direct-to-consumer relationship than television certainly was in 1992. You have advertisers, you have networks, you have affiliates, you have all these other business interests at play that are not about the audience, are not about the audience taste, are not about what the audience wants to watch, how they want to watch it, right? And that's the world that he sort of slammed into, clearly his focus on the quality of the show. Clearly always being like, I'm making the best show, I'm gonna deliver, I'm gonna give it to you, but like, I'm not taking notes from you on, on dumbing my show down, I'm not compromising the quality of my show. I mean, uh, Matthew, I think, talked about the ritual burning of the, of the network notes, you know? Like, that was what he was trying to do. And I think that that maverickness in television in the early 90s, it's just not a formula that, was, that worked. But yes, I think today, a, a great producer like that, you know, who came in and got a show, a streak, a streaming series, and had carte blanche, I think he could do something incredible, right? I think we've seen a little bit of that. Uh, I think, frankly, a lot of big movie producers just stay out of it because they don't, they don't, it's a lot of work. You know, they don't need to do it. Denis Villeneuve doesn't need to make a series, right? He gets to make Dune in the theater. So he's just going to do that, you know? And, and that's, you know, the interesting thing about this too, in that George Lucas, frankly, could have gone to Paramount and said, I want to make a young Indiana Jones film. And they probably would have said, great, yes. We'll put it on the schedule. Let's go, right? Like, like no one was telling him we don't want an Indiana Jones movie. He came up with this idea that I, if I do it on TV, I can do. I can talk about history. I can feature all these different stories. I can make it for families. I can make it accessible for families. Like that was all in his mind. And we don't have an answer to this yet, but I, I hope to get one. From all that I can tell, this was just his idea. I don't think somebody came to him and was like, would you ever consider doing a young Indiana Jones television series? Yeah, it is wild. I, I'd never even considered it before, but you're right, Daniel, in that like he could have just gone to Paramount and been like, I want to make a, a young indie movie. Because even that was around the time where Param Paramount themselves was working on a, a young like Star Trek Academy movie. And, you know, he could have gone. He could have been like, we already got River Phoenix. We did the backdoor pilot and Last Crusade. And, you know, here we go. And they would have ate it up. The difference, though, is that that movie would have, you know, been another Indiana Jones movie. And George didn't want to do that. He wanted to do a, a thoughtful kind of television series that kind of grounded the show a little bit, which I think also in the long run maybe hurt it a bit because fans went into it expecting Indiana Jones, the movie. And while there is elements of the movie franchise present in the series, it's not the same. Like there's, you know, there's no, I mean, there is one episode that has a bit of a supernatural element to it, but which we both love very much. But like for the most one part, <laughs> for the most part, every episode is incredibly grounded. It, it's based on history and there's no, you know, staff of raw and, you know, there's no uh, God in a box ready to kill some Nazis or whatever. It's all pretty much just like Indiana Jones as a fly on the wall or an active participant in, in major historical events of the 20th century. And that's a bold swing. You know, and I think George saw television as an avenue, as a format to really succeed in this sort of undertaking. And I think he was right. No, I think you're right. I think it definitely was a bold swing. It's a it's a brilliant concept. And I think one of you said earlier that Young Indy was kind of a melding of all of his um, personal preoccupations of, of, you know, history, action, adventure. And um, I'm going to ask you to go into speculation mode a little bit. I hadn't thought of Young Indy as sort of George Lucas's masterpiece, but the more I hear you talk about it and make the case, the more I listen to your show, the more I'm I'm coming around to accepting that idea. And you mentioned a lot of the uh, key production personnel that he hired for Young Indy, who went on to play those same roles for The Phantom Menace and the rest of the prequels. And I'm wondering if, in your estimation, his experience with young Indy was so positive, it was sort of the first time he felt like he had everything the way he wanted it, 
in order to make films that that was what allowed him to say okay i think i'm ready to step behind the camera again and direct a new star wars film i think there's i think there's maybe two answers to that i think the the official version is yes that is what that is what happens that's the version he would say himself there is the the story that George directed the Harrison Ford book in for Mystery of the Blues and him getting behind the director's seat again kind of like revitalized his engines. And that's what got him, you know, thinking like maybe now's a good time. And then, of course, you also get the story about him being the post-production supervisor on Jurassic Park because Steven Spielberg was off shooting Schindler's List. So George is basically the, the guy overseeing all of the special effects shots for Jurassic Park. And doing that kind of got him thinking like, oh, actually technology is kind of there now. I can do some pretty remarkable things with the Star Wars prequel. So let's let's start thinking about it. That's the official answer. I actually, as I'm learning more, I kind of err more on the side of he started doing the prequels because Young Indy got canceled. You look at the timeline and Young Indy, he begins writing episode one in 1994. Young Indy basically is done in 1994. There's, you know, some vestiges of it that carry on but like they're still working on it they're still it working clearly on didn't work on abc yes and it clearly wasn't going to have a, f- a future as this big production with lots of stuff going on. and i think we also learned from the book that daniel mentioned earlier that production on even the tv movies was more or less done in 1994 i think actually 95 but but i think your point is still correct yeah i think that he you know when you talk about production you're talking about resources being committed people out in the field but you know, you know, actually one of my pet mysteries is I think there was a fifth TV movie. And I think that the, that the episodes that ended up as the only on VHS episodes and DVD were actually originally intended to be two parts of a fifth movie that just never made sense. Like, it, like, like I could see why they thought we could put them together, but I think at some point they were like, we, we can't put these together. You know, like it doesn't work. So I haven't proven that. I'm, I'm going to find, I'm, I'm looking for it. But, but I think Peter's right that I absolutely right. That in 1994, when Lucas is in that video that you can watch on the DVD or getting to write the script on the yellow pages, that the Young Indie Project had not been successful. I won't say failed, but it had not been successful. It was not the franchise that was going to be George Lucas during the 90s, you know, making the show and, and doing all this stuff. And to be clear, I'm sure that George would have gotten to the prequels. I don't think it was a... Uh... Uh, something that was never going to happen. I think it does interest him. I think he he w- was very excited about the prequels. But from everything we've heard about from everyone who was there, it was like George was really excited about this show in a way that I don't think he ever really was about the prequels. Like the prequels, he got himself excited. It was a bit of an intellectual problem to how to make them work. And, you know, I mean, again, I'm sure he loved them. And I know we love them, at least Daniel and I. But I think with Young Indy, it was like he was happy doing that and everyone we've talked to also says like he would have been happy to keep doing them forever so i think that you know the show wraps up or at least for his point of view it it needs to be put on the shelf for a little while maybe he did intend to go back to it one day we still hope to figure that out uh, to find an answer to that question but so he thinks like okay now's the time to really dig into the star wars prequels it does make a lot of sense that okay, young Indy, the writing is on the wall. This is not how I'm going to spend the next decade of my life or so. I guess I'll do Star Wars. No, no, there's stuff happening in the early 90s for Star Wars, right? Like the the Zahn books in 91. But realize the Zahn books are coming out the same year they're shooting young Indy, right? They shot in 91. You know, the Dark Empire comics come out that year. 94, right, is the year he starts writing The Phantom Menace. So we we can safely assume he makes that decision, he pulls the trigger. Right. And I, I'm sure there are, we could probably find studio documents and memos and stuff if, if people really looked. But he clearly pulls the trigger in 1994. Right. That's the same year you see the merchandising for Star Wars kick into overdrive. Yeah. Right. The original, like the power of the, the force. Power of the force. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Clearly, that's the moment. That's the go, no go moment where it's like, if we're going to do this, we have to bring Star Wars back in a big way. Here are all the things that we're going to do. To do that. And it's a matter of record that the original plan was to have Phantom Menace out out in 97, mm-hmm. right? That that was the original plan. It didn't end up happening. That's why the special editions came out in 97, Shadows of the Empire in 96. All this stuff was going to happen faster and for one reason or another took longer. But if that had happened, you would have seen a very quick pivot from Young Indy to The Phantom Menace, right? Three years, yeah. essentially. 
that's part of the story that isn't really talked about. There is something to the George Lucas myth that I think we all love, but we also all know is a myth, which is that he's all knowing and he has this sort of master plan that is is etched in stone from from time's beginning, right? No, he he's an opportunist. He's an improviser. He thinks well on his feet. He takes a defeat and turns it into a victory. He, he's done that so many times throughout his career, right? And I think when you look at the 90s and the creation of the prequels, there's a lot of that going on. There's a lot of him reading the room yeah. and being like, now's the time. We got to do it. We're going to do it this way. I'm going to, you know, he made deals. And that's something we learned, too, about he was so good at making these deals with studios even then. You know, with the prequels, he made deals with Fox where they basically made nothing off those movies. <laughs> Like, he made almost everything off those movies, right? We learned that he got Paramount to pay for the young Indiana Jones DVDs in exchange for allowing them to release the Indiana Jones films on DVD. Like, what what kind of great con is that? <laughs> like, oh, you want to release my super successful movies? You can do that, but you got to pay me probably a decent amount of money. I actually want to find out, like, what a DVD budget was. Yeah. In, in the early 2000s, yeah. like with, you know, with EPK, with a doc, like what was the standard price, right? Because he got 22 of those. <laughs> it's wild and it's, it's, it's wild. And then there's a the flip side of it too, though, which is that like all of these projects, for the most part, he's putting up the money first, you mm-hmm. know, and then he gets, he, he, he manages to work it out to where the studios will then pay him for it, you know, but every moment though, he, he's putting a lot of himself on the line for his own projects. The Star Wars prequels are probably the best example of that, which were more or less entirely self-funded, partly through the success of, of the special edition films, which were wildly successful when they came out. And then after episode one, you know, made a billion dollars worth of merchandising, which he got a healthy fucking percentage of, then he turns around and uses that to fund uh, episode two and episode three. But, you know, as Daniel says, though, too, it's like, he also manages to to work it out with studios and other people. Cause I think in a lot of ways he was burned very early on in his career by, by people, you know I mean? He talks about like, he nearly went bankrupt with empire strikes back because the initial bank he went to for a loan didn't trust that he would finish the movie. And so they were like, well, we're calling up the loan now. And he was like, well, the movie's not done yet. I can't pay you. And so, he, you know, he had to like go beg and, and borrow some more money from people because Irving Kirshner was like seven weeks behind schedule. So he he knows he knows what it was to be to be hungry. I mean, in a way that most Hollywood you know, executives don't know, like he actually knew what it was to be hungry. He didn't grow up rich. He didn't, you know, grow up in the industry. So he knew that like, you got to put your money where your mouth is. You got to take that leap of faith, but then you also have to make sure that you have the ability to make money on it after the fact. And it's just remarkable business savvy and being able to balance that with the creative pursuits like that. That's, you know, superhuman as far as I'm concerned. Well, every, I think every filmmaker, I can speak for myself, but every filmmaker just sort of, wishes they could just go out and make the film or the the project or whatever they're passionate about right that interests them that they have something to say about george lucas does that every time and if necessary he will take the thing you want and and bend it to whatever he wants to do right he'll take an indiana jones television show that you want you know someone just kind of riding on a horse every week shooting people and he'll make it this meditation on the loss of innocence and the development of the 20th century and, and the collapse of empire, right? And he'll take your Star Wars prequel, you know, that you've been, yes, you've been imagining since you were five. And he'll make it a movie or a series of movies about how, you know, it's all kind of fixed. Like the fix is in, you know, and, and you have to decide what choices you're going to make in a world where good and evil are sort of their, their facades because the bad guys run everything. You know, like that's that's pretty it's pretty real. Yeah. It's pretty hardcore. Yeah. That's pretty serious message to tell children, right? That no, you can't trust your leaders. You can't look to them to make everything right and and right and right all the wrongs. Like you have to make these choices. And this is a man. Nobody gives us enough credit. After the success of the original Star Wars, he's given access to powerful people, to to you know, private spaces with some of the most famous and powerful people in the world. And after all that, this is what he chooses to tell us. And he, he makes Star Wars, he makes a bundle of money. Any other filmmaker, you know, the need Bill knew afraid he makes a successful Dune. Um, what does he do after that? Well, he takes the next job to make the next Dune. That's fine. That's just the Hollywood way. George gets the success of Star Wars and it's like, 
no, I want control over it. I want to be able to make the next one because I don't trust the executives to, to know what's best for my movie. And he's right. You know, I mean, that's, that's exactly true, but he, you know, kind of like lone, you know, cowboy vibe uh, you know, that you get from, from George Lucas, just remarkable. I mean, he, we always talk about how he is kind of all of his characters, but in many ways he is, he is that Indiana Jones. He is that Han Solo kind of guy who's just like, he's wanting to be an artist. He's wanting to create. And he knows that in Hollywood, most of the time, I mean, Daniel and I are both in the industry and know this firsthand. It's like most of the time it's, it's just filled up with BS. It's just like, you know, art is so often corrupted down here by capitalism, by the pursuit of money and this kind of the studio machinations and all that. And like George was just like, you know, I just, I just want to create like, that's, that's what I, that's what I'm working towards. And the only way I can do that is if I'm the one who holds all the cards and he was right to know that he was right to say that. And I think the the fulfillment of that, of that dream is really coming in young Indy, but also I think in the prequels, it's like, these are the moments the, that's the peak George Lucas time. Before you started doing the podcast, did both of you just happen to be huge young indie fans or was it something that you sort of wanted to explore because it was underexplored and then you dove into it and then we're sort of like, whoa, this is much more than I bargained for. I was a big fan. Yeah. I I think anyone who knows me would say that. Um, I will say, though, being a big fan of young indie is sort of like being the fan of a very obscure band Mm. you know like like there's not much there's not a lot of ways to express being a fan of it you can own them you can watch them that's about it yeah right so you know in a way it's like even a more specific analogy it's like being a, a fan of an obscure band that no one else knows about like it's not like being a fan of like the Velvet Underground or something where it's like oh yeah you know it's like 500 hipsters all over the place whatever but it's like it's a show that like it's so rare to find anyone who's even heard of it and then if you do, you can talk to you about it. But I was a fan as well. Um, but the thing that's been remarkable with the podcast is just because so much of this is fresh territory, because it's all like stuff that no one's really talked about before. It feels just so exciting to dig into it because it's like you don't really, you know, you can watch the show, you can enjoy the show, but you, you can't really access the wealth of knowledge about the behind the scenes of it with one or two exceptions. So to be able to dig into it, it's just been like, you know, one's fandom just explodes after, after you start digging in. Cause it's, it's, it feels like you're discovering an Egyptian tomb that no one's known about or something. It's just, it's wild. It's like being a fan of an obscure band that no one's heard of, but our position is no, we're the fans of a Beatles album. You didn't know existed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. Like that's our attitude. It's like a really important artist made this. Right. How do you not know about it? (laughs) Right. Right. Yeah, I mean, as somebody who has spent many, many years reading and appreciating George Lucas and the output of Lucasfilm, um, you know, just listening to your podcast is is kind of like a revelation every week. It's kind of like, whoa, I never knew that was going on. I never knew this story or that story. And even just hearing some of the stories from the people who were working on the show at Skywalker Ranch at the time, it's just you're really getting a window into what it was like to to be there, you know, working on this project in this moment where, you know, it was before the resurgence of Star Wars. So it was the spotlight wasn't on them to the degree that maybe it would be a few years later. And there's this sort of remarkable sense of freedom and play that they were sort of able to be doing this amazing work, you know, in this very unique circumstance that I think they couldn't really find anywhere else or really get anywhere ever again. It was, you know, it was a golden age. I mean, it really was. And I, I think partly that was because it was before the internet. And you know, mm. as soon as the internet comes out, as soon as the prequels come out and kind of that, the vitriol of hatred that came out for that film, even though I think it was honestly a small minority, I really believe that, but their voices were very loud and, and that undoubtedly hurt George a lot to hear that. Whereas with young Indy, you know, it was still that time where like he was at the top of the world, really. I mean, even though he's a very meek guy, I think he's a very shy guy in real life. It's like, this was a time where he was at the height of his game, both in terms of industry standing, but also in terms of fan appreciation. So, you know, the ability just to play and to play creatively, you know, I mean, their writer's room sounds just like a wonderful experience and a wonderful time of just creative freedom. Their shoots for this series, you know, it was a three-week shoot for every episode. Most episodes of at the time had a, a five-day production schedule in America. 
you know, for every, network television shows, five days. Today, sometimes, I mean, I was on a show once that had four days per episode. I mean, that's just mind boggling. They had three weeks and they had the ability to be creative and the directors, they felt like they really had real ownership over their episodes. Whereas again, today or any time in television history, a director is just there to, to basically do what they had done the previous week. Like it's very rare to have a director come in and, and imprint an artistic vision onto a television show because production is just moving so fast. And that's not to, it's not to denigrate any television directors out there, but it's just like the nature of the job is, is one where you're, you're just, you're moving. You got to hop on the train, you got to do your thing, and then you got to get off as quickly as possible because you're moving, you know, people are moving on very quickly. But here it was like, this show was, was truly uh, a movie of the week every week. And, and people felt very proud of, from everything we've heard, people felt very proud to have worked on it. And that's, that's special. That's really special. You guys have talked to, as we said, many people who worked on the show, had many fascinating conversations. And I'm wondering, having it understood that this is not to the exclusion of anyone else, but is there one particular conversation or one episode that if you had to hand somebody one episode of your show, it's like, no, 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 no you should really listen to this one. And maybe that's an unfair question to ask. but I'm No, that's a great question. No, it's a great question. It's a hard question. They're all great. And it's, you know, I do a lot of the editing and post-production and invariably, uh, I think any editor would share this. You know, you start, you're like, okay, I gotta, I gotta get this into shape. I don't know, you know, and then you're done. And, and I'm always just like, I'm so proud of this episode. Like I, I, I feel that every time. And just so, you know, I just, so, so it's hard for me to be like, which is, is the best. I will say, I do think that for new listeners and maybe for people who don't know much about the show, I think the Matthew Jacobs episode is a great place to start. I think that's one of the reasons we we put it early. Mm. It's a conversation that I think is accessible to a modern television fan, uh, but also just sort of takes the show on its, you know, on its face for what it is. I think that the historical documentary one is is wonderful. I don't know that I would tell someone to start there because I, I don't think that would make any sense. I think, you know, if, if you're coming into the podcast wanting to maybe you're not as familiar with the Young Indiana Jones television show or maybe you watched it occasionally once or twice or whatever. Um, our episode with Ray Morton is fantastic. He's a film historian. And, and we just talk about like the context of television in the era and kind of the, the world into which Young Indy was entering into. And it's a really fascinating episode just because, you know, that truly was a different era. The, the whole nature of the industry was entirely different. And the changes were subtle and over time, so it, well, there wasn't really like a definitive moment of, of explosion of change. But it was like now looking back, it's like, my God, it really was just so different back then. And so we we talk about that context. We talk about how things change and, and how young indie fit into that into that world. Um, so it's really good for extra episode. We don't get too much into the weeds on on the series or, or you know specifics about episodes. Um, and then yeah, the Matthew Jacobs episode is fantastic. He was um, one of the regular writers on the show. I think is uh, one of the the most credited writers as well, um, next to Jonathan Hales. Uh, you know, it's really uh, just a, a wonderful episode. And and you know, the joy I think with the series though too is like everyone we've talked to so far is just really pleased to talk about it. You know, I, and I mean, I'm sure you've experienced this yourself with with your Star Wars podcast here, but it's like. You know, some people you talk to and, and they're kind of like, well, I've done this you know, 500 times already. And I, you know, sometimes they get the sense that people are a little bored to talk about the topic or whatever. And but with this, it's it's like this is like it feels like this is the first time anyone has wanted to talk to them about this show. And and they're so excited because they really were so proud of it. It's great seeing people clearly remember stories that I don't know that they've told that much I and mean, maybe in their personal lives with people that they know you know but like i don't think they've ever been to conventions i don't think they've ever been on stages telling these stories but you can see it in their eyes you can see the twinkle you know when they remember being in george's office or when they remember getting into an argument with george you know in the sound stage like like uh, laird malamut did about what whether the music should be right you know and and he had that moment that i love in our show <laughs> that I, I think i used in the teaser which i think it just came to him like he told the story and he was like, it was just two creative people. And he kind of catches himself and he's like, I just equated myself with George Lucas. And you could just see it hit him. And then he's like, well, George is 1.8 you know, creative people and I'm 0.02, you know. But I just thought seeing that moment, you know, seeing him remember that time he worked with George Lucas and they had an argument, like just two people working together and sort of 
get hit with the gravity of that was an incredible experience for me, you know, and that's that's one of the things that the show gives to us. A uh, similar question I may or may not be asking for a friend. Your podcast has reawakened my own personal interest in young indie. I actually had these on my shelf still in yeah. uh, the cellophane. Yeah. So, wow. and now, quality, good quality. so and now that they're streaming on Disney Plus, I doubt I will ever. Though, are the documentaries also streaming on Disney Plus? The uh, no, the... and you, but you have them there. Okay, you have well them then, in those boxes. Okay, You're well one of then, the few people. Well, then I will be opening <laughs> those. You should up. open those boxes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, say there is somebody who wants to watch either for the first time or re-engage with the series for the first time in many, many years. If someone mm. were to say, okay, I, I have time to watch one of these, which one would you sit them down in front of? That's hard. Because I, I have this conversation with people. This is one of those questions. You have a podcast about Young Indiana Jones. It comes up pretty quickly. Yeah. Which one of these should I watch, right? It comes up a lot. Um, I always tell people to start with Trenches of Hell, which is mm. episode eight on Disney+. Plus. That's not the same thing as if I can only watch one, which one would I watch, right? So if you were never going to watch another one again, I would watch Daredevils of the Desert, which I think is 15. Daredevils of the Desert was usually my go-to favorite whenever I was asked about this. I think it's a fun episode. Um, you see very young uh, performances from from Daniel Craig as well as Catherine Zeta-Jones. Um, they're both, you know, they're not big at that time. This is just their, you know, this was their their uh, acting job of, of the month, I guess, or whatever. You know, this was not a, a guest star or anything like that role. But you can see them. They're, they do great jobs and. Daniel Craig hams it up with a, a bad German accent. It's fantastic. That one's great. I also think maybe a uh, Oganga, give her and take her life, is a wonderful one. It gets very philosophical and can kind of show you the breadth of the of the show. I also think structurally, it's it bears a lot of similarities to like The Empire Strikes Back or something along those lines, where it it kind of begins with a big battle, like that's kind of the end of another movie that maybe you just didn't even see. And then it carries on and takes you into a more thoughtful, philosophical episodes after that. Probably those two would be my, my suggestion. The show has a lot of cinematic inspirations, clearly films that interested George. Oganga in particular, it's got a little bit of Apocalypse Now, certainly a little bit of Heart of Darkness, and then a little bit of The African Queen, right? Like it's, it's just a few, a few things sort of mixed into that. Daredevils is just straight, you know, Lawrence of Arabia, like... And even there's a, there, there, on the VHS release in the late 90s, it's one of the few sources of sort of behind the scenes interviews on the show that you can get. And I actually only recently tracked down the, the interview with George because he does a little intro on all of them, the ones that were released on VHS. And he basically is like, well, I had an excuse to have all my characters in, in the Middle East in World War One, And so, you know, we just can do a big World War One in the Middle East movie. You know, like he, he was just sort of, enjoying the fact that he could do it you know and and do this and there's a whole story about licensing footage from the film that was directed by the director of the episode you know so it's like the director is redirecting his own movie and and they brought back actors from the movie essentially playing like they're fictional characters but essentially playing the same parts so you can use them in both footage it's like a very elaborate sort of production thing but it ends up just being one of the more entertaining episodes and also just feel it, it feels thematically like an Indiana Jones movie in fact I think overseas it was packaged with the trilogy in parts of Europe on VHS oh, uh, in the late 90s interesting yeah it's a it's a really fun episode um, you know there's a certain arc in the series where he's an intelligence officer during World War One, he starts, you know, as infantry, you know, trench warfare guy, becomes very disillusioned with that. And as everyone did, I mean, this is, you know, not unique, but he he came to the conclusion that the best course for him in the war is to try to end it as quickly as possible, not to have victory, but just to end the war. And to do that was to uh, become a spy and to try to find ways to achieve peace. And so this is one of the stories of him at really his height of his of his espionage days. He goes undercover to help lay the groundwork for an attack in the Middle East. And Catherine Zeta-Jones is there being all sexy and awesome. And, and, you know, Daniel Craig literally has a mustache that he twirls. I mean, it's just it's great. It's awesome. It's, it's a lot of fun. And he, and he has a fist fight <laughs> with fist fight, yeah. Indiana Jones. And so you actually have Indiana Jones and James Bond fighting. It's, it's, it's <laughs> exactly. notable for that. Exactly. I'm going to cue up 
all the episodes that you just mentioned. It'll be my uh, my weekend watching. Um, you may have already answered this question, but is there anything that through doing your podcast, is there anything that you've learned about either George Lucas or Lucasfilm that you didn't know before? I mean, so much. The, the, you know, again, just the, the, the beauty of this podcast is that um, it's all fresh territory. Like, you know, I've, I've written, you know, literally books on the Star Wars franchise. And like, I, I had no idea about so many of these topics and so much of young indie. I guess the, the, the biggest thing is just how involved George was with every step of the process. Like he was in the writer's room. He was basically the showrunner. This was a little bit before the era of the traditional showrunner that we think of today. You know, I think we can say that the, that era of showrunner kind of begins with the X-Files and Deep Space Nine. But like George was running the writer's room, then, you know, he's involved with the post-production process. He is there in the editing room every day. He doesn't take a credit on a lot of these things. And that's the thing that I've always really appreciated about George. He was happy to be there and to be kind of, you know, the guiding voice, but he didn't need the applause. And that's something that you don't see a lot of in Hollywood today, where everyone scrambling for credit over everything else. He just loved the work and he loved the challenge. And that's really fun. I'm really happy that so far I've learned that George Lucas is the man I hoped he was, right? Because you never know. And, and talking to people who certainly didn't have to talk to me, you know, and, and didn't have to talk to us and, and didn't have to do this, but they were willing to come on and, and tell all these wonderful stories. And, you know, you get the complete picture. You know, for example, I think by the time you hear all the episodes, it's clear that George Lucas likes his chocolate. This, this theme comes up in a number of stories, like incidentally. And I'm like, oh, interesting. Um, <laughs> you know? But like, he cares about the art. He cares about people. He's considerate. You know, he's a little no nonsensey in some ways. But I, that's just wonderful. You know, you'd, you'd hate to hear, you know, as often can be, sometimes people are very good at putting on a facade and, and putting on a show. Like, he, like Peter was saying about Hollywood, it can be a lot of BS. But no, clearly this guy, he was the wizard who lived in the magical kingdom north of San Francisco. And that's that's who he was. And not everybody gets him and not everybody shares his sensibility. And that's that's a truth. You know, we, maybe we've been dancing around a little bit. Obviously, the, the prequels have their detractors and Young Indy has its detractors. I think more so now in some ways than it did at the time, because it was very well reviewed. You know, if you if you read the papers. Right. Uh, but I think a lot of Gen X people would be like, yeah, I remember that show. It was just a little kid, and it wasn't the Indiana Jones movie, so I didn't, I didn't pay attention. That, that, that's usually what I hear if, if I talk to someone who, who did watch the show. And I think you know they're not giving it its due, and they're not giving it a shot. And uh, I hope that our show gets people talking. You know, I hope our show does for young Indiana Jones what George Lucas wanted young Indiana Jones to do for the 20th century and history and all these important things, right? Get them talking about it thinking about it, asking questions about what television should be, what art should be, how, how these things should inform and, and entertain us, right? That's, that's what I hope. Yeah, to echo that too, I think like what the Clone Wars, I think, did for the prequels, which in many ways got people to like re-examine them, you know, even the detractors, you know, got people to re-examine the prequels. And I think now the prequels are, well, I shouldn't say universally loved, but I think the, the love, it feels more, there, there's more love out there on the internet, on the interwebs than there is hate these days. And I, I really love that. And I'd hope that maybe our show can bring some of that to young Indy and really help to promote this, this true, true achievement. I mean, true achievement. Well, you guys have one confirmed convert. So that's one. So if nothing else, I want you to know we that. <laughs> So just as we're wrapping up here, is there anything else that you wanted to add or maybe you came in thinking you wanted to say that I haven't asked you about? I figured we'd talk a little more Star Wars. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, no, but I uh, I just think if you're if you're listening to this and you're, you're a Star Wars fan because it's a Star Wars podcast. And so I hope that you will look at that era, you know, the 90s and the early 2000s, that you'll remember that there was a guy – who had a story and he, and he had things to say. And he was using these wonderful mediums and these, these, these tools and these beautiful pictures and incredible sound to tell you something and to give you something. And that whatever you're a fan of today, and you can be a fan of anything you want, they're not doing that. Like it's a very special, unique thing. 
And I would urge you to take the time to think about it. And, you know, I think if you're a fan of the Star Wars prequels, as, as I, I think you should be, really think about like what that story is, is telling. It's, it's a story of, of a kid learning about a larger world who then becomes disillusioned by that world, distrusting of that world, and ends up rebelling against it in kind of a violent sort of way. Young Indy is a story about a kid getting exposed to a world and then growing up and becoming disillusioned with the world and eventually rebelling against it in a less violent kind of way. There's a lot of overlap with the Star Wars prequels and Young Indy. And you're seeing him, George, kind of playing around with ideas that he will then go on to develop more so in in the Star Wars prequels. So it's just, it's a wonderful chapter in the Star Wars story that is is really fascinating and really worth exploring. No, totally. And I'm about to wrap up here, but you just made me realize something that um, uh, Young Indy and the Star Wars prequels do have in common is that they are both stories where an older George Lucas is visiting the youth of his characters and he's approaching youth from the perspective of an older man than he was when he was telling stories about the adventures of Luke Skywalker and Indiana Jones. And um, when we did an episode on Revenge of the Sith, one of the things that really stood out for us was um, you really do get a sense that this was George Lucas's final word on what it meant to live a good life, how to be a good person. It was his you know, final word on how he viewed politics and society and and a whole litany of things. And we really were struck that it really felt like he was making this statement for his kids and for the children of generations to come. And, you know, hearing you say, Peter, what you just said, there are a lot of, of parallels between what young Indy goes through and what Anakin Skywalker goes through. And now I am more certain than I was before I started this interview with you guys that I am definitely going to have to revisit and rewatch the entire <laughs> show. That's yeah, good. Fantastic. So guys, if people are interested in listening to your podcast, where can they find you and feel free to plug any other projects that you like while you're at it? Well, you can find us certainly on Instagram at young indie pod. And then the show itself and the links are on Instagram, but uh, we're on Apple Podcasts, we're on Spotify, we're on Amazon Music, uh, so you can you can subscribe in any of those platforms. We have a small YouTube present presence. I have to say, I'm not good in, good enough at at keeping that updated. I I've been focusing a lot on the Instagram, but uh, Instagram is is a great place to go just for news and updates and and look sneak peeks, you know, teasers for what's coming up. We always we always try to do that, and uh, yeah, please please uh, follow us there. No, yeah, and I can't say enough good things about the clips that you do post of the show to Instagram. The way that you cut them together with show footage is is, is really fantastic. That's what first attracted my attention and got me to check out the show. And I'm so glad I did, because as I said, every episode, I'm like, wow, I've never heard anyone say this anywhere before. So it's 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 really a really wonderful show, and I, I can't wait to keep listening and hear what else you guys uncover. So So thank you very much for putting it together and for putting it out there. It's our pleasure. Thank you for listening. Well, that is my pleasure. I want to thank my guests, Peter Holmstrom and Daniel Noah, hosts of the Young Indie Chroniclers, for chatting with me today. If you like what you heard, please consider following us at Trashcom Pod on YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram. Transcripts for this episode and all our other episodes are available at TrashcomPod.com, and we will see you on the next one. 